Sound speed. Mark it. 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 Not too much is written about slavery in the West Indies. We hear of slavery, we hear about slavery in America, and so on. But not very uh, frequent that we hear stories about the West Indies, slavery in the West Indies. Although, in the West Indies, one of the largest movement of people from Africa, later from India, and so on, uh, took place into the West Indies, and I thought to myself that uh, th there's a lot of s uh, storytelling uh, uh, here to bring these characters and make them interesting and so on. Um, I decided a docudrama would perhaps be the best way of uh, weaving all this information about indentureship, about slavery, about the abolition of the transatlantic uh, slave trade of 1807, about what happened after Britain sort of put these three places together, that is uh, Burbis Temerara and Esequibo, into what was known as British Guyana, as uh, the British Parliament sort of uh, brought this system now called apprenticeship to wean the slaves away from plantation life, to wean them away from slavery, representing the British public would be the missionaries who would go to these areas, the Caribbean, the West Indies, and they will find what was happening. They would console the, the slaves or those in the period of apprenticeship after abolition of slavery, 1834. You would think that the British planters would sort of toe the line, but now comes another form of slavery this time known as Indian indentureship. Indentureship was not new to the world. Europeans were also indentured. As history would have it, John Gladstone, the merchant from Liverpool, um, he would send a ship with his um, um, uh, field hands to bring back the Indians to the West Indies, to the Caribbean, Guyana to be specific. Gladstone wrote, I was hoping your good offices will be able to induce and ship able-bodied coolies to come and labor on our plantations in British Guyana. One female to ten men would be enough for cooking, cleaning, and also labor alongside the men. It is of great importance to us that the coolies be used as a set-off for when and if the black population is lost on the colony. We imported the Portuguese and their arrival on our plantations was already an immediate threat to the blacks. However, tropical diseases are wiping them out one by one. I should engage our ships to sail to India with our plantation driver, David Youngblood, and a few field hands. They will accompany him and the coolies from India to British Guyana. Very truly yours, John Gladstone, Liverpool. The Indians on their part, they did not know what was happening on this colony. They were promised they are going to the land of El Dorado, the city of gold. They were promised that they would have lots to eat, good working conditions, hospitals, schools. They would make money. They would go back to India. They would get their children married. They would have money for dowry and so on. I'm going to tell you about a place. There is a lot of gold. You should go there. How can we leave our homes? Can you do it? I can't go. I have to get my daughters married. With what? You have gold? You have Cows? Then, who will marry your daughters? What dowry will you give? Tell me. None of you have heard of El Dorado? What is he talking about? The door to fortune! Money! 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 <laughs> so naturally, the Indians, uh, they were enthusiastic when they uh, left India. 
those who volunteered, but those who were kidnapped, and then those who were coerced into this system. At the depot in Calcutta, when they all arrived, these three groups of people now, then they realized that the ship wasn't there. They had to spend many months waiting for the ship. There were many reasons someone would end up going to an unknown place like British Guyana. In India, at the time, the landowners known as Zamidars forced many people off their lands under the sunset law. Those who could not pay rent on their land before sunset on the day it was due would lose their land. Some were fooled into making the voyage with promises of El Dorado, the city of gold, while others were kidnapped. The recruiters were paid by the head. It should be noted that uh, it was the first organized uh, group of Indians to arrive in the Americas. Although Indians would arrive in different parts of the world um, as groups for different purposes, this was the first organized uh, group of Indians to arrive in the Americas on May 5, 1838. I wanted to show what happened for the first time. You have two groups of people. Indians never saw Africans. Africans never saw Indians. And now these two groups of people were meeting for the first time, people from different continents, meeting in an unknown continent. I, Indian, from India. Bia, dear. India, Hindustani. Hindustani? I, I Hindustani. We, Hindustani. Hindustani. Um, Hindustani. Me. Africa. 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 India. Africa. What would be the reaction between these two groups? A lot of suspicion would take place. And so I went to, into sort of reconstructing this period of Indians coming on to the colony, Africans who were there. They, they were sort of uh, um, naturally, they were aware of what was happening in, on the colony. Their psyche was very confident about the surroundings of the colony because they have been there for centuries, for generations. And so in putting together Guy in 1838, I thought to myself that uh, I must reconstruct the first time these two groups of people uh, looked at each other. We have been here for 200 years. Our blood, our sweat is in this land. And we will not allow you to take it from us. We will not allow you to burn our homes down. Where are you from? Who sent you here? The white man came here to destroy us, to burn our homes. We were here for 200 years. Our life, our sweat is in this land. We will not allow you to destroy it. We will defend it with our very lives. The Indians would arrive on May 5th, 1838 for the first time. Emancipation would happen only a few months later in 1838. So you would, the blacks thought that um, now we could even bargain further with these British planters into getting better wages and so on. Or we could just uh, buy their plantations because if they don't have laborers, the plantations would be abundant. And we could buy these plantations 
and we could really make a go on this colony. Look here, man. Let's talk some real business. You see, we know to grow the cane. You know to sell the sugar. That to me, seeing that we are partners, equal partners. So you don't have to worry about paying us anymore. All we do is bust everything in the middle. On the journey as history would have it, only a few women were taken on these two ships in 1838. And I thought to myself that maybe this is the image that this character Lakshman would take with him of India, this image of this girl. And so throughout the film, you will see this girl appearing. Audiences at time when the film was released and in subsequent times, they will ask me about this character. And I would remain quiet because the girl was never there. She was never on the plantation. It was all uh, um, um, uh, different fragments of his imagination at different times. But uh, she would also save him from going crazy. You saw what they did to us at the depot in Calcutta. I thought they'd never catch you. They didn't. I spent about a year f to really find uh, um, the location, the set where I'm going to tell the story. I wanted to shoot the film in Calcutta, some of it, and uh, shoot some of it in the West Indies. But in Calcutta, I had built this set and uh, spent uh, quite some time there. And a day before shooting, the rains came and the floods came. And so I stood there and watched my entire set getting washed away. And uh, I came back to New York. And uh, Guyana had elections at that time. So nothing could happen. So I, I called back all my production people from UK, from India, from the West Indies, from Calcutta, back to base. And uh, we waited about six months for things to normalize and went back at it again. I decided that, well, I probably will shoot in Barbados or in Trinidad, one of these countries. But my heart was in Guyana because the story is there. Um, but, you know, you go through discussions with ministers and so on, and uh, you feel that uh, that you don't, you don't have that comfort of bringing 50, 60 people from overseas with all this equipment into a country, you must have uh, assurances that uh, of their safety. And uh, one day, my secretary told me that uh, the president of Guyana is on the phone. I never met the president. I've heard of him. So I took his call and he said to me, I heard you want to shoot in Guyana. And I want you to know that you should come and shoot your film in Guyana. I met with the president a couple of days later. And I felt of all the people I met and all the ministers or all the different countries, dignitaries or um, heads of state, that I could trust this man, that his word is good. I finally ended up on plantation in Skeldon. Among the 6,000 acres of sugarcane uh, plantation, you would find uh, all the elements of canals and uh, and uh, then uh, on the other side on the fringe of it you would find uh, bushes leading up to the jungle and uh, i thought to myself that wow if i was to shoot the film here and uh, the beach where the arrival of the indians would take place it would mean that uh, i am 
the movement of my equipment and so on to shoot the film would be in about uh, five or six mile area. And I felt to myself that going further in now, about 10 miles away from this, would be now the areas where the jungles are, where I could sort of recreate 1838 after emancipation of the African slaves to create their settlement, known as a black settlement. As history would have it, the blacks after abolition of slavery would start to move into what is known, was known as black settlements. So I thought that uh, here is a good chance to recreate this whole period among the 6,000 acre, then on the fringes for the black settlement, and then move away to the other side where I would create now the depot in Calcutta, and also the arrival of the Indians on a separate area. So now the, uh, I, I marked in length about six miles in length, and in depth about, say, 10 miles. And the entire film, Guy in 1838, will now be shot in this area. And I restricted now everything to happen here. I had uh, my crew requesting reels from different uh, DPs, cameramen, director of photography. And uh, I must have gone through about 300 reels. And they're saying to me, well, you gotta make your mind up. You gotta pick someone. And uh, one day I receive a reel from Matt Urey's uh, agent. And uh, just sort of popped it in the player and uh, the fluidity the movement was just right. And I thought, I thought to myself that uh, this is the DP going to work on Guy in 1838. Um, I had them call Matt's agent. Matt got on the phone with me and some days later I was in Guyana on location already. And uh, I mean, I thought he's a terrific guy on the phone and, uh, and he could really understand what I want. And uh, we got along great. It didn't really take me that long to decide to work on the film. It sounded like a very interesting project, and it sounded like an important film, and a film that I wanted to be a part of. Having uh, completed the script, I started to look into production. I wanted the film to have uh, a look and feel, and these rustic colors to capture the, the rust of the sugarcane leaves, and the greenery of it, and, and the, the texture of the earth the bushes and so on. And so I thought uh, using a digital medium of capturing these images would be, would be the best. I started researching on this, on um, digital equipment. And it's my first film, uh, I, have, uh, I had no knowledge of, of this. So I started to attend some of these um, uh, workshops that uh, Sony and Panasonic would have start researching their equipment. And I came up with a, a camera called the Cine Alta 900 by Sony, high definition. A tremendous piece of equipment. And I thought to myself that uh, this is the camera I'm gonna shoot with. They did some, some trials. They showed me some of the things that this camera does. And I, I like the colors. And you would see, as you would see in the film, um, on the beach, shooting at 4.35 in the morning, uh, the blue skies peeking out, the sun peeking out, the water, and so on. And uh, also they told me that, uh, while looking at these cameras, that you could light up a film set with a candle. I thought to myself, wow, because a lot of my scenes are night scenes. I thought to myself of having these massals, as you see in the film, um, just jute these bags from rice mills. We gathered about thousands of these bags. And I had about 10 or 12 of the locals 
just chopping these sticks and uh, wrapping the jute, the bags around these sticks and pouring some kerosene on it, lighting them up into masals, torches. And uh, it looks so spectacular, so wonderful. So much so that uh, lights taken from America on the set, uh, I, I found that uh, we could minimize the use of those lights and to use these torches, locally made torches. And uh, in slavery, in indentureship, in the 19th century and so on, these were torches used. So I felt to myself, we're remaining true to the period, <laughs> at the same time lighting up the film, the set with such, you know, exotic kind of feel and look. And uh, it worked out great, uh, the way it looked. And uh, you would find that uh, there, uh, when uh, uh, Kabi returned, the Maroons returned uh, from the jungle at the time of freedom, uh, we lit up the entire set with these masals. There were like so many of these actors carrying those masals. And um, I had them hold it in, in, a, in such a way that it will sort of reflect on the, on, on the skin certain areas of the skin, it will give some reflection. And at times when they are walking with it, it would sort of reflect on, on, the, on the bushes, or on the earth, or on the slave huts. So I had them sort of positioned in such a way that we'll always have not only their skin, but also another element to bounce off of it, to give this look, this contrast happening and uh, with the lights we took down, we just had a, a broad spread of that, like a general lighting, a general tone. And these massages will cut through that now to give us this special light and this special feel in the film. Hey, look, we don't want any trouble here. Yeah? This is a black settlement. I think you should take your men and go peacefully. In casting Guy in 1838, Pooja Bhatija, the casting director, I sent her um, one line, just one line of each character. <laughs> and she was like, one line? And uh, I said, yeah, I want them to just give me one line. I, I was really looking for people uh, to show me emotions rather than how to read a script or how to say a line. Because once you could show emotions, true emotions, or you could act emotions, th then I think um, the rest is easy because uh, I did not want to, um, a film uh, like a talking head, just, you know, all these characters just talking and talking. I wanted a film that, that, that would sort of bring the dialogues in by way of emotion. And she did a good job. She brought me about, eventually, about 300 different actors who auditioned for, you know, these pieces. Um, once I wrote the script, I have been living with these characters as I conceived them. And now my script was ready. And uh, while conceiving these characters, I, st I started a sort of... Um, have these images and now I had to live with these images of these characters and uh, when, when actors were showing up for auditions if I couldn't see that image I mean no matter how good the actor was it, and it's a very unfair process I guess but I just don't want that actor to audition I just wanted those images that uh, I saw while developing these characters I want to see those images at the audition and uh, before that, uh, I auditioned uh, actors in, uh, in Britain, in Bombay, in Delhi, in Pune, in Calcutta, in Uttar Pradesh, in many regions of India, many regions of the West Indies, in Guyana and so Trinidad and so on. And uh, as the many months went by, I still couldn't find these characters these images, Kumar Gaurav, a very brilliant actor, 
that's the only uh, I mean, uh, known uh, face that I could sort of uh, uh, think of to bring the intensity of Lakshman. One day, someone mentioned to me, why not Kumagarav? And I said to myself, wow, this is exactly the actor that I had in mind while developing the character of Lakshman. And uh, now someone asked me about it. It's definitely time for me to pick up the phone and call him. I got on the phone with Kumar Panti. We spoke. And uh, I think the conversation lasted about 30 seconds. I told him, I'm looking for an actor to play this role of Lakshman in the film, Guy in 1838. I'm not looking for your star qualities. I'm looking for your acting abilities. And if you're not going to be a star, and you're going to give me, lend me your acting abilities, uh, then I would love to send you a script. Um, he felt that was different. He told me he has this script and he wants to make a movie and he would like me to read the script. So I told him to send me the script. And he sent me the first half of the first draft. After reading the first half, I thought this could be made into a great film. It was a great story, a story which should be told. It's a story about uh, Indian indentureship, which I thought never a film has been made on. He got back in touch and he said uh, he wants this role. I wasn't surprised um, because the story of Indian indentureship, the story of African slavery, is very human. And uh, a, any sensible actor would sort of, uh, I mean, uh, be very interested in taking on this kind of challenge as opposed to a song and dance kind of film as we have in Bollywood as an example. I knew a little bit about indentureship, but not uh, on the grand scale. Uh, I thought, uh, let me research a little bit and find out more about Guyana. So I went onto the internet and got out some more information. And it was amazing to know that so many Indians today settle in places like Guyana, Fiji, Mauritius, uh, South Africa, Kenya, all the sugar growing plantations were Indians taken from, you know, UP Bihar in the 1838 onwards. So Bunty was on board immediately. And now I had to find the other characters. But I think um, he brought some luck to the film because now Pooja was busy putting together um, audition sessions. And uh, finally, she came up with a bunch of actors. And once I met these actors, things started to fall into place one by one. All of a sudden, it was all coming together. And uh, one of the criteria of working in Guy in 1838 for these newcomers, they wouldn't get paid. No pay. And this was my beginning of conditioning the actors because the story of slavery, they were not paid. The story of indentureship, they were promised some money on their contracts that they signed, five-year contracts as indenture laborers. But they were also not paid in many, uh, you know, uh, instances. And uh, <laughs> I wanted these actors to sort of, I mean, go through this kind of reality <laughs> that my God, you know, we're going to go leave New York, we're going to leave California, Chicago, and so on, and we're going to go to this place that we have not gone to, and we won't be paid, and we'll be there for many months. But that's how slaves went, were t taken, and to a great degree, that's how indenture Indians were taken initially. So these actors started to, to sort of get into this mindset, no pay, we're, going, we're not going to be living in luxurious hotels, we'll be put in houses, we're going to be working on a sugarcane plantation, on the fringes of jungles and so on. Oh, Rohit was a taskmaster. Uh, initially, when we landed in Guyana, we were there three weeks before the real shoot happened. So. 
we did all kind of things. I mean, he used to wake us up at four in the morning and send us into the sugar plantations with uh, our uh, machetes to go and cut sugar cane and really, uh, you know, know how sugar has been cut. So we used to wake up at four o'clock, get into the field by about five, um, go into these punts which, uh, you know, they put the sugar canes into after cutting and they uh, go down the canal. So we went through the whole rigmarole of that. I remember in preparation for the role, Rohit would wake us up at all hours of the night so we could get out to the sugarcane fields and actually cut cane. It was a tribute to the laborers that were, that were there on those plantations hundreds of years ago. And it was important. It was important that we actually held that cane and we held that machete and cut and felt the pain of that. It's not an easy task and, and hats off to the people who've done it. We just did it for a little bit and that in itself was painful. The, this cane in itself, the machete, was so heavy. When, when I held it first in my hand, it felt lethal almost. We would have to cut at the right angle repeatedly to just chop it off have them all fall on the ground, create a pile of it, tie it together in a knot, and carry it on our heads. At first, when they held the machete, known as a cutlass in local term, and they were chopping cane, um, it was very difficult for them because they were not used to this lifestyle. I mean, uh, the stumps from the, from the cane, that once you chop it, I mean, it really destroyed their feet. Um, the heat, immense heat, South American heat. Um, at times, I could feel the heat burning through from under my feet, right through my body. And I knew that's what they were feeling too. But they never complained. I was fortunate to have very good actors. I wanted uh, these um, actors to really feel what these people felt in the 19th century. And as long as they were not complaining, um, I pushed them to the maximum. I also recognized the fact that uh, these are, a lot of them are new actors, it's a first film. And I felt responsible for their careers, that, that they should look good, their characters should really evolve, uh, and, and, and they should grow as actors. And so uh, I felt to myself that, that uh, it's a responsibility now on me, not only to tell the story of slavery, abolition, indentureship, but it's also my responsibility to, to give these actors a career, to give them a shot, a break. And uh, therefore, I thought to myself that I should push them to the max. Not every day a film is made on uh, this theme of uh, slavery, of indentureship. I, and I felt it's a good way for an actor to learn uh, conditioning, preparation for a role. Uh, my name is Kern Wasson. I am uh, from Chi-Town, Chicago, Illinois, in the good old USA. Here in lovely Guyana. Here working on the film, very excited. It's a new place, third world country, very simple. I'm used to big city, big buildings. It's very simple stuff. Uh, and I like it. And I'm, I'm excited about the film. All the possibilities that, uh, that, uh, that are there. I want to get down and do some, some down and dirty acting. Um, I think the film's going to be successful. It's going to be something that's never been done before. Um, this is the clean look. Uh, clean look. You got me a clean look. Catch me yesterday. I had a uh, the beard, big eyes. You know, it's part of the slave look. So, um, and I feel like we're living the slave life these last couple of weeks. But that's good. That's okay. I started uh, to take, a, I mean, uh, a different uh, um, mindset to these actors. Um, at first, they were jolly. They were happy. I felt they were too happy <laughs> to, to bring these characters alive. Uh, they were happy because they are away from home and, and, and they're all getting together on this uh, exotic setting of Guyana. 
and the food is terrific and, and the beach is there and everything is working out great for them. And I allow that to happen for a few days, no doubt. But then I made sure they were placed in houses, these actors, except in Komagorov, who had the substance of acting, per se. Uh, made sure they stayed house, in houses where the plumbing was the worst. Toilets wouldn't flush at times. Um, lots of cobwebs in these old houses. And uh, screechy floors. And uh, all I would hear um, members of the crew coming back and telling me that they, all they do is complain. I wondered why <laughs> they were complaining so much. And uh, so they got so mad now. They were getting really angry now. And I was getting so happy that, that uh, I mean, they were really coming into rhythm of these characters now. And there were, I think, six six actors who really had to go through. I wanted them to go through this regimen, and um, um, for some reason they ne uh, they never come up to me and complain. But behind my back, they would curse and complain and they carry on about how they're going to leave the set, and they were so sorry they were working on this film with this terrible director. <laughs> and, when they would come to rehearsals, though, they would be, Good morning, sir. How are you, sir? We are thankful that you're giving us this opportunity to be in your movie, sir. We loved uh, these characters, sir. And <laughs> so uh, this went on, like, uh, every single day for the first uh, five, seven days. And then we even spent, uh, you know, a day, maybe sometimes a night, on the beach where the real ship landed. So he wanted us to get a feel of that. And uh, we just hung around there on the beach, uh, you know, getting into character. Think of the people, how they land, what it must be when they landed here first time. Uh, so he gave us a lot of mental as well as uh, physical uh, training for the role. I noticed uh, these actors, they shed their, their thinking about having a good time. They really started to evolve and becoming very sincere to these characters. I had written on the script. Initially, I had um, sort of stripped the dialogues out of the script and given them only the description of their characters and uh, the movement of the characters with very little um, indication of dialogues. And uh, so I took them out one night and I had them all into this workshop situation, a group. And uh, I think uh, the British actors also were invited to create a plantation in this room, whereby on the fringe are the British actors, these British characters. In the center, we have these Indian characters. And on the other side, the African characters. So now the rehearsal would take place. But it was a different kind of rehearsal that night. It was kind of rehearsal whereby each actor would have to now tell me about it, what their character means to them. And uh, lo and behold, each one of these actors manage, not only in describing the depth of the characters that I had written and what I, what I meant for these characters to do in the film, but also I found that, that they were really in the depth of emotions. I remember um, the actor that Amit that played uh, Tikaram. He broke down, started crying when he really got to the depth of emotions. No food, no water. And you want us to trust these people? You want us to trust them? And you, you talk about your God. Where's your God now, huh? There's no food, no water. Why did we ever have to take that coin from that Salasina? By now I started to hand them more lines of dialogues. And... Uh, I had them now exchanging these dialogues without a script. 
just going back and forth with each other. And uh, if they are sort of coming out of line of these characters a bit, I would stop them and bring them back and said, kill that line and come back here and, and then keep this line going. Lo and behold, um, after maybe three or four hours, I thought to myself that uh, we are very good, we are ready now. These actors are conditioned, they are ready for their role. So I threw this big party for them, <laughs> finally. <laughs> lots of food, lots yeah. of music, lots of laughter, and uh, some nice drinks and everything else. And they partied for, on the beach for about uh, eight, ten hours, right into the night. And uh, <clears throat> the following day, I found that uh, they were late for rehearsals. I found when they eventually showed up to rehearsals, they were a little bit carefree. And uh, they were sort of casual again. And it, it was then I was now about two weeks away from shoot. It was then that I made up my mind that they will never, ever again, for the rest of the shoot, have such a good time. I think Rohit is a genius. If you are making a movie about slavery, you should take your actors and treat them like slaves. And by making them all live in this house with no hot water and not paying them, and forcing them to eat, you know, really <laughs> primitive food, I mean, you know, we'd ask the actors, oh, what did you have for dinner? And they would say, like, oh, you know, I had some some cold rice with, you know, a little bit of like chopped, you know, vegetable. They, they wouldn't even say what kind of vegetable. And we were like, oh, that's, that's crazy because we had like fried snapper and some shrimp curry and, you know, and we went to the, the Chinese restaurant and had some beers and it was nice. And, but Rohit was, uh, was brilliant that way because he didn't pay the actors and he made them just live like slaves. And so they really got a new character. And so they all came to me, I think, on the second or third day after this kind of uh, th thing happened after the party and uh, they sat down with me and uh, they renewed their vows <laughs> to these characters again and uh, after they understood me and I understood them we went in this into this incredible journey of filmmaking and uh, this continued until the very last day, until the very last shot. They stayed in character. The, these actors literally stayed in character 24 hours a day, as if they were in this 1800 period, 19th century slavery and indentureship. All the actors, the British actors, the black actors, the Indian actors, they all remained in character throughout the shoot right to the last moment. So much so that the crew, the lighting department, the sound department, the camera department, they started to toe the line and all of a sudden it was a very, very serious set. Shooting um, began about the 22nd of uh, March. I wanted a sort of a late evening night session to take place. And uh, everyone showed up, even the actors that were not involved in those scenes, they showed up. And we became now like a big family. Lachman, uh, played by Kumar Gaurav in Guy in 1838, is uh, a folk legend. My grandmother used to tell me stories about uh, Lachman, who would uh, run away from the plantation. The system in the years, um, the Indians were placed in places called bond yard, and they were called bond coolies. Twenty less than when you started? Quite probably. They all lived and labor on the Gladstone plantations. Fred and Hope, Fred Stein. If you say so. And from today, they will be known as the bond coolies. And I do say so which means that uh, you're restricted to this plantation or to this area in Guyana, and you cannot step out of this area. 
and uh, Lakshman was uh, this folk legend would uh, sort of run away and he was very daring and I thought to myself that uh, wow I should write about this character I should sort of bring this character to life in the film and uh, in bringing him to life in writing about him when I went to UP Uttar Pradesh in India and I went to these small villages and I, I started to write about uh, I mean uh, what would drive uh, such a daring character personality what would drive this personality to go to British Guyana and I thought to myself that in taking the line of this character that uh, it's easy to say that he would volunteer to go so I, I started to write about this person that uh, his mother, his father died. His mother and him were left to pay their landlords, known as zamindars. And they had the sunset law that if you don't pay the rent by the, on the day that you're supposed to, and the sun goes down, at the time the sun goes down, you lose the land. And so in indentureship, in the story of indentureship, they would give an advance to those who, are, who they could attract to make this journey. And with that advance, maybe this character could save his late father's land. So his mother will now have a place to live. And while he go on this journey to hopefully make some more money and come back and take care of his mother as she gets older in life. And he could also set up his life. And so um, I started to write this character and develop this character. And uh, I'm so thankful to Bunty uh, Komagora for bringing this character to life because if you were to look into his eyes, the way he portrayed Lakshman, not a lot of dialogues, not a lot of action sequences, but just the movement of this character, the way he sort of lifted this character um, throughout the film, I was very pleased. Uh, uh, by the way, scene by scene, he was weaving this character, brilliant actor, Kumagarav, brilliant actor. And uh, it was uh, very different uh, working uh, uh, treatment he got, not because he's a big star, everyone was treated the same, but because he understood, the, uh, I mean, what acting was about, what filmmaking was about. So he was, I was always sort of easy on him. I had done about uh, 30, 35 films before I did uh, Guyana, uh, but I had no apprehensions doing the film because after reading the script, um, which Rohit had written himself, uh, I was sure that he would make a great film. A man who could, uh, with a vision, who could write a script like this, I mean, would definitely make a good movie. Uh, again, because uh, the story inspired me so much because it was the first time I was doing a lead character in an uh, English language film. And the lead character was of an Indian, uh, so it was not that I was playing a role of uh, a small role of insignificance in some American film or European film. It was a lead, and uh, so it was a great story about our people, their strength, their courage, their um, determination, you know, to get away from their own country, to find a living and making a home away from home. Once I uh, developed the character of Lakshman, I thought to myself that uh, living through slavery, there must be a character who had similar traits so that when these two actors, these two characters will meet, they, w they would sort of, uh, of uh, form a bond, a special bond. And in developing Kabi, a maroon, someone who is very innocent, growing up through slavery, watching his father getting whipped. He runs away into the jungles, become a maroon, and uh, he returned to find that there is freedom, abolition of slavery. And I thought to myself that uh, maybe this character and Lakshman could sort of uh, form a bond because Lakshman will leave India, his home, volunteer to make this journey into another country and uh, to look for betterment 
and the role of Kabi, he would leave the, the settlement, the plantation. He would run away from plantation life, and he would return after abolition to make a living, a life for him and his family. And I thought to myself that these two characters could really bond and, uh, and sort of uh, appreciate what each other is going through at this time in their lives. I hear the white man say that day in the field, you run away? You? You want to run? Don't even think about it, man. We run. We hide. But at the end of the day, we were still here. In creating the character of Ermila, the girl, I thought to myself that uh, any person that is leaving their tongue, their city, their village, their home, their country, and they're going to another country to live or to work. The one thing they would do is to capture images of their surrounding. That maybe this is the last time I'm going to see my village or my home. And they will capture these images, you know, and, and, and to make these images everlasting. And I, I thought to myself, what would Lakshman capture in his mind? He is leaving his mother behind. He solved the problem of saving his father's land uh, by taking the advance from the recruiters to make this journey. And uh, so it, it must all sort of happen in a rush, that before sundown he have to pay this money to save his land. So he grabbed this advance, he paid that, and now he have to go on this journey. So he was taking to the depot. So I thought to myself that Finally, he is waiting now in this holding uh, area for the ship to come to take them. And he have time now to reflect, to think. And I, I thought by sort of uh, bringing a character of an Indian girl, a woman, at this depot, that uh, maybe he could sort of capture this image and take it with him. I wrote the character of Ermila, an Indian girl. Um, she was looking after the livestock and uh, she noticed him in the depot. He noticed her. And I thought to myself that this is what, this is the image that he is now going to take with him on this journey to British Guyana in 1838. The, the, this imagination of an Indian woman. The director made sure that we were prepared for the role by getting into the depths of the character as much as possible. It's never enough, but he did really push us. The film was important for him, but as well as for me and many others, being first-timers or newcomers. So we had to make sure that we knew what we were doing and that can only come through preparation. Parts of the film, you would find that this girl shows up all of a sudden. Uh, he, he is telling the story about what happened, why he came to British Guyana. And this girl is there. And he's saying that uh, my father died when I was two. My mother and I. And he would continue to tell the story. So. It is like he's telling it to someone. He have a, someone accompanying him through this journey. At the end of the film, when he would uh, sort of, towards the end, uh, he would escape. In that instance, he would think of her, that she is defending him. That someone is representing him, someone is on his side. Such was, uh, I mean, the times of indentureship of slavery when e even people that uh, they were living among thousands of people, they were still very much alone because each one had to deal with their pains, with their sufferings. So he escapes and then in the film you see this girl comes to defend him. She grabs a gun.
she approaches the overseer's wife, Anna, played by Rose, a very brilliant actress. And uh, then Anna breaks down. And Anna says that I'm also living in hell for my husband's sin, in reference to the overseer, James Bullock. And so in the end of the film, Lakshman returns. And uh, as he returns, the girl is there again. And this time, she is showing him approval. You know, she's happy. Someone is waiting for him. And this is what is keeping this character going. That she is always there. Someone is there waiting for him. Someone is there walking with him. Someone is there on this journey with him. While his mother is back in India. His family is back in India. So it's time now that five years of indentureship, the contract is over. Some of the Indians are going to return to India. And uh, with Lakshman is this girl. And at the end of the film, you would see they're both saying goodbye to those who remained. The time had come now where we have to put the skills, the rehearsals into practice. And uh, I was going to shoot the scene now in the sugarcane plantation where the actors would now use the cutlass, the machete, to cut the cane. And they would bundle them, carry it on their heads. All of a sudden, I started hearing some crackling noise from a distance. And uh, then I started to see uh, clouds of smoke entering the area of the plantation where we were working, um, shooting. And all of a sudden, fire started. Fire, lots of fire. Apparently, the area where we were shooting, just across the canal, they were burning that area now to chop more cane. You know, they would burn the fields before um, uh, cutting the cane. So they started burning about 500 acres of land, of sugarcane. And the heat was so immense, so immense. The heat from, from the sun, from the ground, and now they were burning 500 acres right across the canal from us. Everyone was like in panic because this heat started to really get crazy. And I said to myself, well, how wonderful could this be? <laughs> because now, we are really placed into the in, into positions where these laborers were placed, where slaves were placed, you know, I mean, centuries ago. And so the, the heat continued to affect the actors now. So Matt looked at me and, and he was waiting for me to say, like, well, let's call it off or wondering what I would do. And... Uh, I was like, there is no way we're going to call this off. This is like just too perfect. It's very incredible like, to burn that whole cane field and sit there and film it. You know, you could feel the heat just coming off the cane. And right before they burn the cane, also like all these animals and birds and snakes and creatures of all kinds come out. And... Here in India, we cut sugarcane as it, after it grows. There, they burn the fields. So when you cut sugarcane, it's the burnt sugarcane that you cut. Why they do this is what gets the snakes, the reptiles in the fields away, you know? And um, I think it's a different process of making that sugar because the Guyana is famous for its Demerara sugar, which the whole world, uh, you know, gets it from there. The more it burns, the more the wind is picking up on it. This whole momentum is going on. And I noticed my actors, these group of people who went through this very rigid rehearsals, they grabbed onto the machete, they ran into the field, they start chopping cane. Everything was just happening now. Uh, I, I call action and I never call cut. We were just filming every, as much as we could capture, from whatever angle we could capture it. I had the steady cam there. He had no time to rig his steady cam. I just told him, grab the camera, throw it on your shoulder, and just go with it. And whoever follow with your tripod, wherever it lands, attach your camera so we can get a mix of shots. Some movement, some still, whatever. And uh, 
So about 10 minutes after this all started, I found the extras, the locals, who were sort of sitting on the bylines of this, they all got into the act. Now all of a sudden, more than a hundred people are surrounded by this uh, flames on one side and, uh, and smoke engulfing them and heat coming from the other side of a field that they had just finished burning sometime that morning. So we are surrounded by all of this happening and uh, the camera is on, lights are on, whatever reflectors are going, uh, punts are placed on the canal. And these actors, actresses, extras, film crew, everyone just started to work on their own. The film did not have a director, a producer, a writer, nobody at that moment. I just allowed them all to just do what they felt they must do in this situation, what a laborer must do in this situation, what someone cutting cane must do in this situation. Now, they created such an urgency, it is to tell you that uh, this urgency is nothing new because when Indians arrived in 1838 and they were working their land, they had to work under these conditions. An overseer will not say, well, you know, we're going to burn the field over there, so you may just sit and rest for a while till we do this. They won't say that. They'll say, you better keep cutting. We want production. And, and so this whole thing was happening, and it went on for about half an hour or maybe more. By the time it got over, by the time the, the, the smoke is starting to settle in a bit, and... Uh, we could see that fragments from the, the cane leaves burnt are just flying now in the air all over the place and uh, it's going on the skin, the ash is going on the skin of all these actors. So then I call the makeup department and ask them to leave the set because now we have real elements on the clothing, on the costumes on the skin of the actors and uh, it was coming on to lunch period and so I now brought back the actors into their characters and let them do their lines after this all chaos that took place and I got the dialogues out we had our lunch <laughs> and throughout all of this for the rest of the day I I don't think I heard anyone spoke. So now, the burning of the field was unexpected. So I thought to myself that how about if we burn a field now, days later? Would you believe it was all planned and staged? We're going to burn this field and we're going to show now that when the Africans at the time of, uh, of freedom, they, they, would, they were so overjoyed that they, they want to burn the past, that, that they would just burn this plantation down. But when, when we planned it and we burned this field, it was nothing like when it was unexpected days before. I mean, when we stage this burning now, it was nothing like, I mean, like when it was totally unexpected. So, you know, the elements of fire, of water, wind. In making such a period film, you deal with these elements all the time. The element of fire, because in lighting up these massals, it's always with you throughout the film. And the element of water, the canals, the Indians arriving from the Bay of Bengal to Guyana, it's all water, all the shores, so on. And then you're de dealing with the element of wind. The element of wind because, you know, if your actors are not positioned in a certain way and, and the wind is blowing towards them, it could sort of move that fire into burning the other actors. So working with, with unpredictable things, the movement of, of water, the movement of fire, the movement of wind, 
and these were the elements went into making iron 1838 under these conditions um, lots of care went into these these things but at times and working with animals you, you just can't control those horses and so on. you just can't control these elements so it was very challenging to, to work with all these elements into one film it was very challenging this is the toughest film I worked on then we were in the same clothes because they had to be dirty, we had to you know, break into those clothes, uh, make them look as if we've been living in them for days, there were no slippers, uh, uh, hot, uh, it was tough but I think all that helped us to get into character you know? and uh, I think it was one of the greatest experiences that I had as an actor because um, I was not doing, first of all I was not doing a Hindi film. My language was English, which I was doing for the first time. Uh, otherwise, I worked in Hindi films. Uh, there was no song and dance. There was no superheroes. There was no uh, melodrama. It was uh, factual, inspired by real characters, history, which made it much more interesting and much more difficult. When I arrived in Guyana, to start production of the film. I was looking to reconstruct um, the Hesperus. And so uh, building this huge ship, this boat, is quite a challenge, you know, in, in making a, a film set. And I thought to myself that uh, maybe we will make the lower deck only. I thought to myself that maybe we would sort of uh, um, make a small miniature and shoot that. But I wanted to be so true to the story and I wanted to have that feel for what the Indians felt and before them the Africans felt. Being in an actual lower deck of a ship, of one of these uh, slave ships. And so I found uh, this um, small boat about 25 uh, feet or so and I thought to myself that maybe this will be the element uh, of um, that will float and now I should build around this element and um, I got some boatmen together wonderful boatmen and uh, started to build this ship we ended up building um, 89 feet in length 21 feet in width, about 15 feet in depth, and uh, this construction started going on. I had it built right on location, on the beach, at, uh, in quarantine. And so it would take us about four or five months to complete uh, reconstructing the Hesperus. One night, I decided to enter the lower deck and uh, I remember it was so eerie, naturally so dark. And uh, once the hatch was closed, um, I went into this period of time as if this was really happening all over again. And uh, you have to be into that uh, moment to really understand uh, what people went through, what Africans, what Indians, Portuguese, all the people that came by ships in those periods of time, in, those, uh, in that period of time. Uh, you have to be in that moment to really understand uh, what they felt, what it was like um, to, um, and uh, even more, the uncertainty as to where you're going on these voyages to be locked up in the lower deck of the ship and uh, it was not until someone touched me that I, I realized that wow I mean we are really making a film here on the 29th day of January 1838 the Hesperus left the Bay of Bengal 
carrying with it 165 Indians. 135 were men. 11 were children. And six were women. <laughs> they spent all of February, all of March. I wonder what happened to my mom. And all of April. Locked in the darkness of the lower deck of the Hesperus. I wonder if she knows where I am. Baba? She prays for you. Uh, coming back to the ship, the Hesperus, when it was all done, I took the actors when they arrived in Guyana about three or four weeks before uh, actual shooting. I took them out um, one day. It was very hot. And uh, I had them enter the lower deck of the ship. That time the, the upper deck was not uh, floored. So the sun was really beating their backs. And uh, I wanted uh, them to start their, uh, their uh, getting into character. And uh, they, they were all sitting there. They were all sitting there in this blistering sun. They all had their heads down. And I asked them to sort of listen to the rhythm of the ocean. Because eventually when we are shooting, the, we are going to shoot the film, I want them to move to sort of create this movement uh, of them being in a ship that is sailing on the high seas. And uh, all of a sudden, it was so quiet. One of the things I realized is that uh, at times you have to take yourself out of the story. Although I wrote the story, created these characters, I realized that I have to take myself out of this story to really, uh, to really tell this story. And uh, by taking myself out of it at times, I push the actors into it, deeper into it. Because now, now I was very objective about, about telling the story. I had to keep my emotions in check right through the development and shooting of the film so that uh, I could be fair in telling the story the way it really happened. Um, at times you would want to, to have some degree of anger as to what happened to your people. But uh, I had to also check that and to make sure that I had a, a clear mind and to be fair in telling the story, really how it happened, um, regardless of the fact that uh, the British planters, the British merchants, the British overseers, the British field hands, and so on, um, raised havoc on these plantations. White men, they're coming into our black settlement. Look, they're coming. They're going to kill us. Amy, my friend, I see you and your people uh, are happy on this land. Good. You're not my slave anymore. You're a true friend, and I always take the advice of my friends. Sometimes they are very far-sighted. Once you'd given me some very good advice. You asked me to get myself some other slaves. Well, here they are. I thought you would like to make them. Hey, look, we don't want any trouble here. This is a black settlement. I think you should take your men and go peacefully. Oh, I intend to. As soon as I take care of business here. Today in the fields, your guns was mighty. But here I tell you, it's where we rule. Here you are squatters living on British property. We are free people. And this land is our land too. Freedom does not entitle you to live on this land. Well, try to yourself. 
You. Throw out their belongings and torch their houses. Close reconstruction of what happened. I feel satisfied uh, that uh, I have told a story that is very close to what happened uh, in 1838 and in subsequent years. Carby, my runaway friend. I hope you're not teaching this fine coolie here your old tricks. Because if he so much as thinks of running, I will hunt you down before him. Carby, uh, play, played by Henry Rodney in the film, plays a maroon. A maroon is someone during slavery who would uh, run away from the plantation. They would go to the jungles, where they were called a maroon community, would be formed. And uh, they would stay there. At times, maroons in places like Jamaica, where it's very popular, it was popular, uh, they would come back to the plantations at nights, and they would uh, really give a very hard time to the British planters. Um, Maroon is very popular in Jamaica. It is not as popular in Guyana, although we did have Maroons. And Henry Rodney, who played Cabby, a Maroon, uh, portrayed this character. Although a Maroon is tough and, and very, uh, and very um, sort of uh, rough and all this, I wanted that character to sort of uh, bring some innocence some innocence to, to his uh, um, uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, when it comes to, to, to his persona. However, it was the time and, and, uh, and the things that happened to these people that drove him even an innocent person into becoming so, so um, sort of uh, fierce you know, someone to run away and an and, and innocent person now to, to live in the jungle, among all the other things that could happen to them. The Buck people, the indigenous people, the Amerindians, known as Buck in common terms, um, they were paid by the British planters to hunt down the Maroons and bring them back to the plantation, or runaways rather. So in Guyana 1838, I had, uh, there was a scene, a huge, seen now about eight, nine minutes in Lent. And I wanted these two characters of Lakshman and Kavi to now tell their stories. And uh, in this portion of storytelling, I wanted them to, to sort of put the audience into this period and to sort of explain or, or, or to, to talk about things that happened. Um, the Maroon Kavi would talk about uh, a century before where they had a huge uprising in Burbies. And Lakshman would talk about, about what happened to him when he arrived a whipping. And uh, he also wanted to be a runaway. And he also wanted to meet the, that white man, quote unquote, um, who f came and freed the, the, the African slaves. And, uh, and, and so, so these two characters, one coming from the background of a maroon, the other coming now from a background of, uh, of a farmer placed into quote-unquote slavery by way of Indian indentureship, indentureship system. And uh, now may want to turn into a maroon, a runaway. But his dream was, I'll run away, maybe I'll meet this white man who freed the Africans. And maybe he could free our people too. So, as time went on, the role of Kabi, the African Maroon, during slavery, and now the incoming Indians, and, 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 uh, and, and the role of Lakshman, that, uh, well, I'll run away, but maybe I would try run away to meet this person who freed you, your people. So, with time, with time, the roles of these people would change. With, as time changed and evolved. And it would all go back to what was happening in England, in Britain at the time. If the British Foreign and Anti-Slavery Society, if they, if they were really on the backs of these planters, 
if they could lobby the House of Commons, the, the Parliament, to, to sort of take steps towards what was happening in the West Indies and in the Caribbean, then of course these characters would also, according to the body language of these people, they would also respond in their way. So while Kabi was a maroon, he ran away and stayed in the jungle and returned after slavery. Now, with time, the character of Lakshman would not make it to the jungle, but he will look for the person who freed these black people so he could also get his people freed. It is always seen in uh, films on slavery that uh, the Africans are being whipped. In Guy in 1838, I thought to myself that I want to give audiences uh, a new experience and also at the same time remaining true to history. So in Guy in 1838, you would see the scars of the African actors. Which proof did that to you? But you will not actually see them being whipped. And uh, you will see the Indian character, that of Lakshman and so on, getting whipped now. So I thought to myself that uh, we have two situations here. One is going into production. We, we need makeup for old wounds that the Africans had endured and for fresh wounds that the now Indians would be beaten. And uh, a very young girl from, uh, I think two or three of them from uh, uh, Pennsylvania, they submitted some of their work um, for during auditions. They also submitted some work for me to look at, at their capabilities of creating makeup for wounds and all this. And I looked at it and I think uh, Julia is about in her 20s, I think. Uh, but it's amazing, the, the quality of work is truly mind-blowing. And I thought to myself that, you know, these young people, they're so creative, they need a break. You know, it's easy to go and, and sign up an experienced makeup artist. But I thought to myself that, you know, I have a lot of new actors and it'll be nice to put these makeup people also on board, bring them on board. So they are very much new to the craft, but the quality of their work is very good. I'm very happy that, uh, that I had the chance to give others a chance to come up and to show their creativity, to show their talents. My grandmother also used to tell us folklores about uh, the culture, about the songs, the music, how, how they entertained themselves uh, um, in the midst of what was happening to them by the plantocracy, the, the British planters, the overseers, the drivers on these plantations. And uh, how do you fit all of this in one film? It's a lot of story to tell. Also, I, I wanted to develop a historical perspective to this. And uh, I did not want to lecture to to people, so I thought to myself to find a, a balance is to make a film that is in the form of a docudrama per se, whereby it's not uh, uh, preaching or lecturing to people, but it is bringing some characters alive in telling the story. I wanted to independently release the film. All the word has had started to get out now. Um, that the film is on its way um, to release. An inquiry started to come in. We sort of make up this website about this film. And uh, I wanted to release the film um, at a time uh, when uh, the biggies are not in the theatres, so that it, we could have good um, sort of deals with the theatres. So I picked September 24th, being that it's after Labor Day weekend, the last big summer weekend for major films. Now, the theaters are more um, uh, available. And I also wanted uh, to have the film I into the theaters before the, the, it gets too cold, into the, the winter. So September 24th was selected. I'm just in the middle of the, after Labor Day weekend and also before you know, it gets too cold. And also at a time when kids are back to school, when they're, they're focused now on education again. And uh, so I started marketing the film by way of word of mouth. 
people start to talk about it, that this film was made in Guyana about indentureship, about slavery, about British times, and so on. And uh, my radio station, RBC Radio, um, a lot of spots, a lot of discussions started to happen. And uh, those who listened to the station started to call in their one tickets to support the film. No one had seen any preview even as, as yet. It was only a few weeks before release date that I released the trailers. Would you believe we were editing the film until five days before release? And uh, the film was all ready now. I sat down with Technicolor, we looked at the final work and uh, I was pleased. And uh, tickets went online a few weeks before. Um, I booked this United Artists Theatre in Queens, accommodating about 660 seats. And I booked the entire weekend and I paid for that. And I said that, well, we're going to show the film here in Queens, opening weekend. Kumar Gaurav came down, the actors are all happy now. We, we all went through so much of work and so much of emotions and everything else. And now finally, our film is going to see the light of day. Um, a couple of days before premiere night of the seven or 8,000 seats available at the theater for all the shows combined that weekend, uh, um, about 6,000 tickets had already sold. And I thought to myself, this is, a, this is amazing for an independent film, you know, by a first timer. And also, uh, I mean, self-distributed that, uh, that maybe, maybe this could be a case study for film distribution, independent film distribution. And uh, maybe, maybe I have a chance here to help new filmmakers or independent filmmakers by sort of playing this up. And, and by sort of uh, writing about this later on and speaking about this later on, that how we could help them to release their films. And uh, when, when the film was, we arrived there um, on opening night. My God, there were people everywhere. There were people four or five blocks around the cinema just waiting to get in. And the theater only holds like 660 seats per show. And I had booked like 13 shows for the weekend. You couldn't squeeze another show in there. On Monday, the numbers came out and I started getting calls from MGM, from Metro Golden Myers, from all the studios, film distributors, studios, press, Hollywood Reporter, IndieWire, everyone for interviews, this, that. And I was so tired, naturally. I was invited to the International Film Festival in Belize because they were holding a retrospective on my movie, The Right and the Wrong, which I made about nearly 25 years ago. And there I see, what I see is that there are big Bollywood movies, big Hollywood movies competing for the Best Picture Award. And amongst them all, there is Guyana 1838. And I'm wondering, and I'm saying to myself, amongst these biggies, big budget, big star cast movies, how will Guyana 1838 fare? And I'm watching it keenly because I'm interested. I'm, I'm the movie maker who pioneered the movie making in the West Indies, and, uh, and I'm keenly watching the audience reaction, and I'm keenly watching the voting because they had that big booth and the public was voting. And all the few days that went by comes the final day and they invite me because I was the pioneer movie maker of the West Indies to be, to be uh, opening the envelope. So there's this suspense and this tension. And as I open the envelope and the best picture award goes to Guyana 1838, not only am I surprised, but of course I'm so happy because it's a movie made in the West Indies. But I'm also wondering, what is it that prompted the powers to be, even the voters, to declare Guyana 1838 the best movie of the year? And then the movie maker in me started wondering, and I said, yeah, I think 
they recognized the passion of the movie maker behind the project. They don't factor in the budget or how much money he has to spend or how big his market is. But the people who are able to see what is it, they see behind the making, they see a passion, a devotion. And I think that the maker, Rohit Jagasar, and I, I really applaud him and I really uh, uh, congratulate him because uh, he was able to beat out all these Bollywood movies and Hollywood movies and come back from Belize with the best film of the year award. It, it made me feel really good. Now, of course, I've just finished my movie, Rainbow Rani, shot entirely in Guyana with, uh, of course, better technicians and better equipment. And uh, uh, that experience has uh, enriched me and I hope it enriches the movie making uh, industry in the West Indies. And I, I understand that after the success of Guyana 1838, uh, Rohit has lined up some more movies to uh, be made and other people I hope will make more movies because I, I, I am very happy because I have a, like a, a fatherly feeling towards the West Indian film industry. The first time I heard about Ghana 1838 was uh, a few years back when I heard Rohit was making a film and it was about the same time when I had just joined RBC Radio. Uh, the subject was very intriguing. I had never heard about uh, Indian indentureship. That was pretty new to me, and I thought, why not educate myself also? And being from India, I wanted to know all the stories. And uh, that was the time when I heard about uh, this, and I said, wow, this is the subject. You know, this is going to be very much in. Nobody has ever touched that subject before. So that definitely was very interesting. Guyana 1838 will be a permanent record depicting the indentureship of our grandparents, of which our children, our grandchildren, and future generations will make maximum use of it, not only for looking at it, but to use it as an example for for future upliftment it, it is very important to know our roots and heritage and this movie Guyana 1838 will be indelibly registered in myself and everyone that sees it and I hope it does the same for our children and grandchildren to come I know Rohit last 20 years. He's very straightforward and very dashing person. I think he decide any project. He very much involved in that project and he very serious about that project. I think he's very sincere in his work. Rohit has a good music sense. I must say Rohit, myself and Kanchan. It was a good uh, musical team. We work very hard. We brought music gravitation in Indian Caribbean market. I think so, the all credit goes to Rohit. Yeah, there are so many hit albums with Rohit. The Kuch Gadbad Hai, then Na Manu Na Manu, then Gayani's album Lego Mina Raja. It was super hit and the people still remember. Mm -hmm.